Greetings, friends. Uh, we come to Jonah chapter 2 today. Again, if you have your Bibles open to Jonah 2 and a notepad and a pen, you can jot down points as they may strike you. Chapter 2, we find here that God hears from Jonah. In chapter 1, Jonah heard from God. God gave him instructions what to do. Now that he ends up in the belly of the whale, God, it's, it's reverse, role reversal. God hears from Jonah because Jonah prayed. In chapter 3, we will find out how Nineveh heard from Jonah because he preached. But now we're dealing with chapter 2. In verse 1, we read about his distress and danger. In verses 2, 3, 5, and 6, his despair. And verse 4, his encouragement. He has to encourage himself. Verses 4 and 7, his assurance. So let's look at this chapter. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed. When did Jonah pray? <laughs> Why aren't we serious about praying during times of good health and when things are fine and we're prospering? The same lips of Jonah that were shut with his sense of guilt earlier on the ship until he was caught out by drawing straws. The same lips that were shut with his sense of guilt earlier were now open in prayer. Where did Jonah pray? In the belly of the whale. No place is amiss for prayer. In 1 Timothy 2, 8, the Apostle Paul says, I would that all men pray everywhere. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. We are living temples. Jonah was in solitary confinement in the belly of the whale, yet he could communicate with God. So we've seen when he prayed, where he prayed, to whom did he pray? To the Lord. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. To whom? To the Lord. In verse 6, we read him say, O Lord my God. We, friends, we are in a covenant relationship with God. This is an encouragement to those who may be backslidden or spiritually cold or going through a dry spell to return to God now. Don't wait for things to get worse or the situation to become dire. And what did Jonah pray? Out of the belly of hell cried I, and you heard my voice. That's what he prayed. Notice, we may cry out to God from the belly of a whale, from the polar regions, from outer space, Obadiah 4, God says, Though you make your nest among the stars, from thence I will bring you down. We have literally had astronauts who've worshipped God while they were Christian astronauts who've given God praise while they were in space. So from the belly of the whale, from the polar ice caps, from outer space, God still hears us. But it's impossible for answers to our prayer after one has literally died and gone to hell. Remember the rich man and Lazarus? His prayer, his request to Abraham for one single drop of water could not be answered. The time to pray is now. Dear friend, if, if you've strayed from God, the time to call out to him, to cry out to him, to pray is now. Don't put it off for too late. And if things are going well in your life, the time to pray and to praise him is now. It's always a good time to pray and praise the living God. He cried out from the whale's belly. Abel's blood, we read in scripture, cried out for vengeance to God. The Lord Jesus for those three days, his very body lying there on that stone in that new tomb cried out to God to supernaturally intervene. 
Question. Who cast Jonah into the sea? Was it the sailors or mariners? Was it God? Was it the devil? Well, literally, physically, it was the sailors who did a heave, ho, and tossed him over the, the outside of the boat. That's literally. But who caused the storm? It was not the devil who caused this storm. In a sense, it was of Jonah's own making, and God caused that storm to arrest Jonah to stop him in his tracks. Listen, friend, please. We know the devil is, is up to no good, but don't put the blame for, the, for our mistakes on the devil. All right? So let's give him a break for now. We're not belittling the harm he does to people or to this world. But in this case, he was literally thrown over by the sailors, but the storm was caused by God. Now let me tell you something about the devil. No matter what happens in this world for the believer, for the Christian, for the child of God, the devil ultimately loses. See, he thought while the storm was whipping up to a frenzy that he would get all the sailors, passengers, uh, and merchants in the boat all their lives that he would get all of them killed but the devil lost not all of them lost their lives then he thought when they tossed Jonah overboard he would get Jonah again he lost because just when he thought he got Jonah when Jonah hit those waves God provided the whale to rescue Jonah it reminds me of a line from that song you know Jesus is the winner man the winner man the winner man and what does it say about Satan Satan is the loser man, the loser man, the loser man. And what's the next line? The loser man all the time. When it comes to the children of the Most High God, Satan is the loser man all the time. I had to put in the Jamaican reggae uh, accent there. I, I hope you could appreciate that. We know that the sailors literally hoisted and tossed him overboard. But Jonah says in verse 3, for thou has cast me into the deep. Jonah knows it was of God's making, that God was arresting his attention. So yes, God is the one who, who plonked Jonah in the deep, but at least mercifully in the belly of the whale as he intervened so that Jonah would not lose his life. Notice, As Jonah says, you have cast me into the deep. If we could but understand that Jesus, that God is our champion. He is our savior. He does the fighting for us. And he is ready and willing to rescue us if need be. And again in verse 3 he says, you cast me in the deep in the midst of the seas. The floods compassed me about. For those three days... You know, we have an expression in English, come hell or high water. For those, for those three days, it may not have been literal hell for Jonah. But for those whole three days, it was high water for Jonah the whole time. It was always high water for Jonah those three days. With problems bearing down one after another, he quotes Psalm 42 verse 7 where David says, all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Actually, that's messianic about what Christ would suffer. So again, Jonah's an incredible type of Christ in these ways. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. But in Jonah's case, it was of his own making for his own sin. In the case of our precious Lord Jesus, it was because of our making and of our collective sin. Figurative. For David, it was figurative. For Jonah, it was literal. For Jesus, it was beyond literal. What he suffered was indescribable. You know, Jonah's quoting David, the psalmist. It is said, and I agree with this, that the most powerful way to pray is to take God's own word into his presence, to put God graciously in remembrance of what he has said in his word. So commit scripture to memory. You'll 
always have opportunity to use it and to bring the enemy down when he tries to attack you. In verse 5, he says, the, water, the waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Whereas, and uh, we recently studied this in the book of Philippians, whereas sin brought Jonah a laurel wreath of rotting, decaying, slimy seaweed. Obedience to the word of God will bring a victor's crown, a Stephanos, that's a bay, parsley, olive leaves, which is given to the victorious athlete who finishes their race in, in standing their ground in faith for Jesus Christ, or to someone in a, at a festal banquet crown. So instead of Jonah receiving a Stephanos crown, he receives a crown of rotting, decaying, slimy seaweed about his head. Jonah feels, and he expresses this, the mountains above him and the earth barring him in, in verse uh, 6. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. To those, listen to this statement, to those who contend with God, it would seem that the entire universe is against them. So beware when you catch, find yourself or someone else saying, everything seems to be going wrong today. Well, maybe the Lord's trying to tell us something. Did you talk to Jesus today? Did you take your burdens to the Lord in prayer? Or are you just trying to walk in your own strength? So if you think everything is going wrong, turn to Jesus. Lay your petitions before him. Verse 4, he says, I'm cast out of your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. Now this is the beginning of a turnaround. Listen closely. I am cast out of your sight. See, Jonah thought that God had completely forsaken him. If he had considered Job, who was sitting on a dunghill, wearing sackcloth and ashes and covered with boils, if he had considered J Joseph's plight when he was put by his brothers in a pit and left for dead, if he had considered David's plight hiding in a cave, running to save his life from Saul, but still, even if we compare these three examples of Job, Joseph, and David, none of their situations or their plights were as dangerous, or none of them needed as great a miracle as Jonah at this point in time. And what is the misery of those who are damned to an eternity in hell without Jesus Christ? What is the greatest misery? That they are cast out of God's sight. I'll read verse 4 again. I am cast out of your sight. That is the worst thing. To never be in the presence of God and enjoy his fellowship. What is the misery of the damned in hell? That they are cast out of God's sight. And what is the joy of heaven? But the vision and fruition of God to enjoy his presence. And he says, yet I will look again towards thy holy temple. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple against hope. It looked like an absolutely hopeless situation. He's tucked away in the belly of this whale. Basically, the living dead. We can't call him the walking dead because I don't think he could walk around. I don't know. But he's the living dead, literally entombed alive. And he says, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. Against hope, Jonah believed in hope. When there seemed to be no hope, he speaks hope. This is a powerful statement of his faith and trust in God. He professes that he will come out alive. Yet again, he was not talking about in eternity, in this life. I will look towards your holy temple. In Hebrews 11, 1, we read, Now faith 
is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It looked hopeless, but he hoped. Question, for what purpose does Jonah desire to live? He didn't say, Lord, give me another chance at life and I will obey you. He says, if I'm given a chance at life, I will look towards your holy temple. In other words, if you let me live, it's not like I will obey you on this one point and then going about my normal life. No, if you let me have another chance at this, Lord, I will look towards your holy temple. My focus, my future will be fixed on you, on worshiping you, praising you, honoring you, and proclaiming your goodness. Remember that, friends. Not just give me another chance at life. So what was the focus, the purpose he desires to live? To look towards God's temple. David says in Psalm 27, 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, to inquire and behold the beauty of the Lord. Similar to Hezekiah in the book of Isaiah, chapter 38, verse 22, because he was dying of some terminal illness, and Isaiah tells him God will give him another 15 years of life. He said, what is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? He didn't say, what is the sign that I will live and enjoy and be able to feast again? What is the sign that I will go up to the house of the Lord? Remember, we used to sing a, 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 a chorus. The reason I live is to worship you. Not for self-serving purposes. We are alive to worship and honor and praise and serve the living God. That is the only reason we should desire to live, to know God, to serve Him and love Him. Now, if you want to turn your circumstances around, every single one of us is faced with some challenge or challenges or, or circumstances. If you want to turn your circumstances around, watch Jonah. And you cannot tell me that the situation or situations you're facing right now are worse than what Jonah faced. You cannot tell me that. Watch these three things. One, from a position of fleeing from the presence of the Lord, he now desires to look towards God's holy temple. Wow. Second, then his prayer, he said, which was prayed out from the lowest depths, in the belly of the whale, in the depths of the ocean. His prayer was prayed from the lowest depths, ascends to the highest heavens. You couldn't get a, bit, a greater distance there. And third, from the depths of his despair and misery, divine deliverance begins to be wrought or worked on Jonah's behalf. And here he makes another incredible profession of his faith. In verse 6, he said, Yet, the second half, hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Yet you've brought up my life from corruption. He is, he is filled with hope that God is going to deliver him. He was like buried alive. Now this is powerful. John, in John's Gospel 11.21, we read where Martha says to the Lord Jesus about her brother Lazarus, Lord, if you had but been here, he would not have died. However, in this instant, he says, yet you've brought up my life from corruption. Jonah knew his God was able to do what Martha doubted. Jonah knew that his God was able to do what Martha doubted. And this is not to knock Martha. We're just making this observation. And now in verse 8, he says, and I want us to read this. But uh, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Notice he has become hopeful, he is repenting, 
what the things he says that cause God to bring him out of the belly of the whale. So these are very important points, uh, statements to observe and to understand and study. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Verse 8. When he says lying vanities, either those who worship false gods or idols, maybe like the mariners or sailors, or those who disobey God's commands and live willfully in sin. These are those who observe lying vanities. So those type of people forsake their own mercy. They cannot expect God's protection and mercy until they either receive Christ as Savior and Lord or turn from their sins and wicked ways. And now we come to four steps, powerful steps that lead to Jonah's being jettisoned out of the belly of the whale. I've titled it, Four Steps to Triggering Your Way Out of Problems or Challenges. Four steps. I don't want to sound like one of those motivational speakers. Four easy steps to success. But here's four things as we study the words that came from Jonah's lips that caused him to be propelled out of the whale's belly onto dry land. And I've likened it to uh, firing of a gun or a pistol. There are a few steps. So he unlocks the safety. In verse uh, 2, he starts. It says, I cried by reason of my affliction. Unlocking the safety is unzip your lips and begin to pray. Cry out to God and then turn it into praise and worship. So, step one is unlocking the safety. Unzip your lips. Cry out to the Lord and He will hear you. Step two, the priming. Priming, verses four and six. He says, Yet will I look again to your holy temple. Yet you have brought up my life from corruption. Actually, that scripture, Yet you have brought up my life from cor corruption is also quoted in Psalm 16, verse 10, and it's messianic about the Lord Jesus. Yet you brought up my life. You will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption. So, turn your desires towards God. That is the uh, priming. So first he unzips his lip, cries out to God, and now he starts to say, I will look towards your Holy Temple. You will not let me see corruption. And now we come to the loading of the gun. Loading in his steps to his release. Verse 9, I want to read that. But I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. These are the last words that Jonah speaks before God causes the fish to spit him up on dry ground. So this is even more potent. Please hear me now. I call this the uh, the loading. So praise and worship will move God as almost nothing else. We're going to bring out a scripture. Psalms 76 verse 1 says, In Judah is God known. There's another message on that. But the root word of Judah is Jew. And Jew, would you know it, means praise. So in Judah is God known. If you want to know God, praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him in the morning. Praise Him in the moon, noontime. Praise Him when the sun goes down. Here we find verse 9. The last words He speaks. I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will thank and praise and worship you, oh my God. So you can see his, his fingers getting on the trigger now. And he continues. He says, I will pay that I have vowed. Now, whether you're a New Testament grace-giving believer or a tithes and offerings person, whichever way, and I, I can do it, I do a whole seminar on biblical stewardship. But the point is, most any person has been guilty of withholding or keeping back part of what they should have 
put into the furthering of the kingdom. Jonah says, I will pay what is owing. So, either we have robbed God and withheld, or we need to make retribution to somebody else whom we may have defrauded. So he says, I will sacrifice with thanksgiving, I'll praise and worship you. Whoever I've kept back from, whether it's the, 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 the local church, uh, somebody else I may have defrauded, I will return what I owe. And then the last thing Jonah utters before he is ejected from the whale. He says, salvation is of the Lord. Now please follow me. He says, salvation is of the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D in the Old Testament stands for Jehovah. So that means salvation is of Jehovah. Which means, listen closely now, which means salvation is of Jehovah, means Jehovah saves. That's Jehovah saves. This is the last sentence Jonah utters. In the Wycliffe Bible commentary, in Matthew 1.21, when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary, he says to Mary, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Look at the White Wycliffe Bible commentary. It says Jesus, the name Jesus means Jehovah saves. Jesus means Jehovah saves. The, the word of God we read this four times. It talks about God has become my salvation. Unwittingly, Jonah, the minor Old Testament prophet, because Christ has not yet come in the flesh. He says, Jehovah saves, which means Jesus. And that's the last word he speaks in the belly of the whale. And it says in verse 10, And God spake to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out on dry land. Oh, my friend, there's power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah and praise God. We read in Isaiah 12, 2, Behold, God is my salvation. Uh, in Exodus 15, 2, The Lord is the strength of my life. He now has become my salvation. And he became that in Jesus. He has not provided, God has not provided your salvation and mine. He has become our salvation. Jesus means Jehovah saves. That was the trigger. And if I may say so, the Lord could not handle it anymore. Jonah, you're right on track. You began praising me. You said you'll make things right where you've done things wrong. And now you're calling on the name of my son, Jesus. God says to the fish, go and cough up Jonah on dry land. I like this. Please hear me. Philippians 2.10 we read, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Right? Now hear me. I don't mean to be facetious. Hear me. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. At the name of Jesus, every whale will cough. And Jesus says, cough him up. The whale has to cough up Jonah. Hallelujah. You know, just imagine a field marshal or an admiral giving an order. Are they not obeyed immediately? Imagine a king giving an order. Is he not obeyed immediately? Imagine God giving an order. Even a whale has to obey. Hallelujah. It is his creation after all. And if you believe you came from a monkey, we'll deal with that in another session. All right? That whale is his creation. Imagine God, Almighty God, giving an order. In the military, they call it marching orders. This whale got swimming orders from God. I don't know whether he got such a massive tickle belly or a huge belly ache, but when the whale swam to shore, it coughed up Jonah in one piece, intact on dry ground. Listen to this thought. Every creature, even beasts with brains the size of a P, 
peanut to perhaps the size of an apple. Every creature obey God the first time. Except for mankind. That's why in Psalms 4, 2 we read, O oh, you sons of men, how long will you love vanity and seek after falsehood? How long will you turn my glory into shame? Aren't we blessed with a monstrous size cranium and brain? Why don't we obey our God the first time? And in closing this chapter 2, as a classic type of Christ, the Lord Jesus died, was buried to quiet the storm that sin raised over our lives. He lay in the grave three days and three nights as Jonah did, a prisoner for our deaths. But the third day, Jesus, our Savior and Sovereign Lord, came forth up from the grave. He arose to bring forth everlasting light to the whole world. And now we can victoriously proclaim victory in the name of Jesus. God bless you.